Okay, very good. So the second topic for today is power counting. Power counting and momentum derivatives. Let us draw any Feynman diagram with many loops. And so on. Then this Feynman graph corresponds to an integral over many, many loop momenta. Let's say d, d, k1, d, d, k2, and so on. And how does the numerator actually look like? The numerator is automatically the product of all propagator denominators, and each propagator is a polynomial in the momenta. So overall, if we multiply all the denominators, we get some polynomial in the momenta. So we get, for example, k1 square to some power n1, k2 square to the power n2, times uh, whatever, k1 dot k2 to some power n12 times other objects plus uh, more terms like this. And what we can do is, of course, we can simply uh, be interested in the case where all loop momenta simultaneously become very large. And then what matters in the numerator and denominator is simply the highest degree of the case in uh, the numerator and the denominator. And everything which is not of highest degree can be neglected. And uh, then we can decide based on uh, this highest order uh, behavior whether the graph might be divergent or not. And so we define what is called omega of the graph is uh, the so-called superficial degree of divergence. is simply the number of uh, loop momenta in numerator minus denominator. So it's the naive power counting that you can do. So, let us uh, look at the master formula. Which is integral d dk divided by an object um, minus k square plus q to some power n. That was essentially the master formula. And now the main point of the master formula is not all the complicated prefactors, but in the end, it contained a gamma function. Gamma function of uh, what? Of n minus d over 2. And that gamma function was responsible for the 1 over epsilon poles. So it was responsible for whether we have a divergence or not. So. What is actually the omega of this master formula? Numerator degree minus denominator degree in the loop momentum k. In the numerator we have d. In the denominator we have 2n. So the degree of divergence is d minus 2n, or in other words, 2 times d over 2 minus n. And so you discover here the argument of the gamma function. So that shows you the first divergence happens if this argument here is zero, that is equivalent to omega being zero. And uh, the next divergence happens if this argument is negative, this is equivalent to omega being positive. So that shows the master formula is directly of that form that for negative omega, it is uh, completely convergent. But for positive omega or zero, 
we can get divergences. So it is always finite if omega is smaller than zero uh, and has potential the divergence for omega bigger or equal than zero. And that is the general case. So naively you would say if an integral has uh, as many powers in the numerator as in the denominator, it is logarithmically divergent. It behaves like integral dk over k, which is logarithmically divergent. So that is the naive criterion. And if you have uh, integral dk of k to the n over k, then of course, and n is positive, then it's even more divergent. But if you have integral dk over k to the power one plus epsilon and epsilon is positive, then this is finite at the upper limit. And so this completely corresponds to this naive power counting. So for one dimensional integrals, this power counting is exactly equivalent to diverging or not for large k. And for the master formula, it also fits. And it also fits for all our one loop examples. So let's just remind ourselves of our one loop examples. In all cases, the power counting is basically uh, in direct correspondence to the result. So the one loop self energy had a divergence which is proportional to p square and m square over epsilon. And the degree of divergence is two in six dimensions because six loop momenta divided by k to the four in the denominator is degree of divergence two. And the divergence is a polynomial of degree two in the momenta and the mass. Here the three point function had a divergence which was a constant divided by epsilon and the degree of divergence is zero um, because we have six loop momenta in the denominator, uh, numerator and um, six in the denominator. And indeed, the coefficient of the divergence is a polynomial of degree zero in the momentum, in other words, a constant. We didn't calculate it, but uh, you could easily see from the master formula that such a four-point function is finite in six dimensions, and it has omega equal minus two. So for all our one-loop results, we have the following observation. The ultraviolet divergence is always a single one over epsilon pole. And uh, the coefficient is a polynomial of degree omega in the momentum and mass. And then we could cancel those one loop divergences by local counter terms, as we know. Now let us uh, look at the general power counting of a completely arbitrary, uh, complicated graph. Okay, not completely general, but uh, let's stay in a scalar field theory where the propagators always look like one over p square minus m square and in the numerator we have nothing, always one. Then the degree of divergence of a completely arbitrary graph is the number of uh, momenta in the numerator is just coming from the integration measure and for each loop we have d powers of k so we have d times l, where l is the number of loops in the Feynman diagram. That is what we have in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have for each internal propagator, we have a k square, so we have minus two times i, where i is the number of internal lines. Uh, where 
the line must not only be an internal line, but uh, we are restricting ourselves to one particle irreducible diagrams. Then each internal line is also part of a loop. Okay, uh, that's our general power counting. Now can we do something with this? Um, yes, we can simplify it or rearrange it because uh, it would be nice to connect this somehow to other properties of the graph. For example, here we see the two-point function has omega two, the three-point function omega zero, and so on. And uh, if you remember the exercise, you already uh, discovered some interesting um, generalities, namely, no matter how many loops this thing has, the degree of divergence of the two-point function is always two. So how is this possible? So let's uh, check that and uh, we can derive uh, what we saw in the exercise uh, in general. So for this, we need some uh, graphical properties or uh, graph theoretical properties. So there is a topological formula in Feynman graphs or in uh, mathematical graphs in general. So if you have I internal lines and V vertices, then uh, this is equal to the number of loops minus one. So this holds for connected diagrams. Okay, and in quantum field theory, you can easily derive it by imagining the derivation of Feynman rules in the derivation of Feynman rules, initially for each line in Fourier space, you have one integral over the line's momentum. If you go from position space to uh, momentum space, then each line has an integral and each vertex has a delta function. And then you kill most of the integrals by using the delta functions and what remains are loop integrals. However, uh, there is also one delta function which remains that corresponds to overall momentum conservation. And therefore, you cannot kill all delta functions, but one delta function remains and the rest uh, remains as loop integrations. So this is a formula. And you can check it, of course, here, for example, two internal lines, two vertices, and one loop fits. Then there is an incidence formula which is three times the number of vertices is equal to two times the number of internal lines plus the number of external lines. And this holds for a phi cube theory. And uh, so this is the number of vertices and external lines. And here this simply means incidence, take any vertex three lines must end at each vertex. And uh, each internal line has two endings. Each external line has one ending at a vertex and therefore uh, the numbers have to match up. Okay, so now we have three formulas. And if we combine them cleverly enough, then we can derive something interesting. For example, from the last two, we can first of all eliminate the number of vertices by adding three times that plus this, then we get three i minus two i gives i uh, equal three l minus three plus e. Okay, and uh, then we can uh, take the number of internal lines and plug it into the formula for omega. So then we have uh, d times l minus six times L, so we get omega equal B minus six times the number of loops. Then here three times minus one times minus two plus uh, six minus two times the number of external lines and then we have our omega for a general graph in phi cube theory uh, and the graph should be connected and one particle irreducible. Okay, so this is the general power counting and now let's discuss it in uh, some detail. So let's put D equals six, which is our default choice. 
what happens in six dimensions. That becomes simple. So omega is just uh, depending on the number of external lines. Omega is equal to 6 minus 2e. Very simple formula. And that fits to our observations. Namely, a two-point function has uh, omega equal 2. Correct. A three-point function has omega equal 0. Correct. And the four-point function has omega equal minus 2. Also correct. And the thing is independent of the loop number that we saw in the exercise by going through many examples. So no matter how many loops you add, uh, as long as you keep fixed the external lines, the power counting doesn't change. And that is also related to the fact that the coupling is dimensionless. Anyway, uh, we can then uh, say it like this. We have omega of any self-energy diagram, no matter how many loops here this uh, should be the meaning of this symbol, is always 2. Omega of any cat pole diagram, no matter how many loops, is always 4. Omega of any three-point function, no matter how many loops, is always 0. And omega of the rest, no matter what, is always smaller than 0. Now, this has a very important consequence, at least a hypothetical consequence. Let us look at this observation here. Let's mark in red this observation, which was that at one loop level, the uh, divergence is always a polynomial of degree omega in the momentum and the mass. Now, suppose this observation were always true, not only at one loop level, but always. Then we would know from here that the two-point function would always have divergence, which is a polynomial of degree 2 in p square. That would, uh, okay, cannot be a polynomial, but anyway, this would be a constant in the momentum, and the rest would be finite. And then we would see from this plus that red observation that we could always cancel the divergences by a local counter term. This divergence could always be canceled. So I should write this down. So if the observation marked in red were always true, then it would follow hypothetically, that all divergences can be cancelled by a local counter term, namely by a counter term Lagrangian. And that counter term Lagrangian has now a well-defined form, namely in order to cancel anything coming from the two-point function, we need a polynomial of second degree in the momentum, so we can cancel this by such a term in the Lagrangian and uh, such a term in the Lagrangian. This gives an arbitrary Feynman rule with a polynomial of second degree in the momentum. So the coefficients of that can always be adjusted to cancel the divergence from here. And so we see that this would correspond to field renormalization and mass renormalization as we already had. This divergence could always be canceled from a term linear in phi with some coefficient which could arise from tadpole renormalization. And this divergence could be cancelled by phi cubed. That gives a constant. Uh, and this could cancel this divergence. And that could arise from coupling renormalization. And we don't need anything else because the rest is finite. So we would know this. That means it would be very nice if we could prove that this red box would be valid at all orders. So in other words, that the UV divergence is always a polynomial of degree given by uh, the power counting. Let us 
let us just have a quick look at uh, other dimensions, d equal 4 or d equal uh, 8 or so, just to see some contrast. Because as I said, I mean, this was now a very peculiar case where uh, the loop number drops out of the power counting and the power counting becomes completely um, simple. Uh, but of course, this is only true in six dimensions, but that I told you six dimensions is the case where the field theory behaves in the normal way. So this is the normal way. Let's look at d equal four. At d equal four, over there we have minus two times the loop number. So that means the more loops, the more finite the theory becomes. And uh, starting from some particular loop number, maybe three, omega is always negative. So at some loop order, there are absolutely no emergencies anymore. And uh, we don't have to deal with this uh, divergent renormalization anymore. What happens at higher dimensions, d equal eight, for example? Then we have over there, plus two times L, so the more loops we have, the more divergences we get. And that would mean, uh, going into this discussion here, that uh, more and more green functions would involve divergences. So if we have many loops, also a four-point function, five-point function, and so on will be divergent. And that means, in order to cancel the divergences, if they are local, uh, we need more and more terms in the counter term Lagrangian. And if they are non-local, we cannot cancel them at all. So uh, we have more divergences. And uh, so for example, um, let's write some graphs which have degree of divergence zero. So in eight dimensions, that four point function would uh, have degree of divergence zero. So we would need at the one loop level, we would need phi to the four counter term. Uh, then at the two loop level, this graph here with uh, five external lines has also power counting zero because it has five or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight propagators gives uh, 16 powers in the denominator and also two loops, so 16 powers in the new, so this has omega equals zero. So in order to cancel a divergence, we would need phi to the five and so on. So at the three loop level, a six point function would be divergent and it goes on like this. So we get more and more divergent green functions. In the end, we get infinitely many divergent green functions. So we need, if the divergences are local, uh, we need infinitely many terms in the counter term Lagrangian. If they are local, then we can cancel them by infinitely many terms, and that is actually done, and it makes also sense. But um, we need infinitely many terms, and usually each term corresponds to a free input parameter of the theory, which is an adjustable numerical constant, which should be matched to experiment. So you need infinitely many constants matched to experiment until or before the theory becomes predictive. So that is kind of an unphysical theory, even though uh, all of this makes a lot of sense in the context of so-called effective field theories, but uh, let us not go there. But uh, still, what happens here goes under the name of non-renormalizable theories. And non-renormalizable is meant exactly in this way. It does not mean the theory is divergent. The theory will actually be finite because, I mean, I don't uh, tell you too much if I tell you that, of course, the observation will be correct in the end. So the divergences will be local and they will have this behavior and they will be canceled by this counter term. So the theory will be finite, but it contains infinitely many terms in the Lagrangian and one has to uh, deal with the meaning of that. But that is okay, but the name is non-renormalizable theories. Now let me, um, should we make a break uh, of a few moments? No, okay, let's do a break. <laughs>
Okay, then let's continue. Along with power counting, we should now have a look at momentum derivatives of Feynman graphs. And uh, if you take any Feynman diagram with depends on which depends on some external momentum p, then you can, can take a derivative with respect to p rho, for example. So let's imagine a Feynman diagram with a loop momentum k, and then the integral contains, for example, p plus k square minus m square. Of course, some other factors might also depend on p, but then at some point the derivative with respect to p, you can pull it inside the integral and then it acts on this p of the propagator. What is the result of evaluating this derivative? You get the loop integral, with all the other factors, and then from this derivative of the propagator here, you get a chain rule, so propagator square, p plus k square minus m square square and then from the inner derivative you get minus one because of a denominator times two times p plus k uh, not square but k rho. What happens to the power counting of that graph? So here the graph had some power counting and that numerator uh, contributed 1 over k square. Now the power counting has changed because in the numerator we have k and in the denominator we have k to the 4. In other words, the power counting has decreased by 1. So omega goes to omega minus 1. And in general, if we take n derivatives with respect to the external momentum, okay, let's say it like this, n derivatives reduce reduces omega to omega minus n. Because it goes on like this. So if you act with a second derivative, two things can happen. Namely, either you take another derivative of the denominator, then uh, the same thing happens as before. But maybe you also take the derivative of the numerator with respect to p, but then also the k cancels and you also lower the degree of divergence by one. So anyway, the external momentum derivative always reduces the power counting by n units. So what does that mean? So of course that uh, sheds some light on uh, the fact that the divergences are polynomial in the momenta because polynomials are the unique functions whose uh, derivatives at some point become zero. Any other function which is not a polynomial, you can take uh, infinitely many derivatives and it never gets zero. But for a polynomial of degree n, you take n plus one derivatives, you get zero. So let us take the third derivative with respect to the momentum of the self-energy. Let's say here we have q and here, or let's say k and here p plus k, then exactly this happens here. Let's just uh, use a simple graphical symbolic notation. So each derivative is now denoted by a dot in the propagator which depends on p. Okay, and never mind what the indices actually are, rho, mu, sigma, whatever, doesn't really matter. But anyway, each dot co corresponds to one derivative and uh, we know each dot reduces the power counting by one. So this, whatever it is in detail, is definitely a one loop integral with power counting omega equal to minus one, since originally we had omega equal to. Therefore, since at one loop, power counting is uh, obviously directly corresponding to the master formula, uh, and then uh, we immediately know that this is finite. And therefore we know uh, that the divergence which was there to begin with is at most a polynomial of second degree. Similarly, here, one derivative of the three-point function gives us wherever uh, the external momentum p is, let's say here, we get a Feynman diagram with power counting minus one. So since we are at one loop, we know uh, that 
um, superficial finiteness implies actual mathematical finiteness, and so this thing is finite. And therefore, the divergence, which was there to begin with, is at most a constant in the momentum. So this explains these previous observations. 1 over epsilon poles are polynomials of degree omega. Okay. okay, let us try to shed some light on the behavior of our two-loop graph. So this two-loop graph had this property that the divergence contained a non-local part, 1 over epsilon times a logarithm. That uh, would give infinitely many non-zero derivatives. So the overall omega is 2 of the graph, yes, because uh, we know that's always 2 for a self-energy. But we had this 1 over epsilon times a log of p square or minus p square. So let's act with a third derivative onto the diagram and see what happens. Okay. Uh, in order to do it, first of all, we should uh, think where is actually p. So which propagator here depends on p. So uh, that is not unique. We have to assign some momentum flow and we are free in choosing the momentum flow, so we always did this. Here was p plus q, here was q, here k plus q, k, and here also q. Then only this propagator down there depends on p. And so if we act uh, with a derivative with respect to p onto the diagram, then in this uh, symbolic notation, we would get three dots here on this line. But nothing changes here in the top part of the diagram. In particular, we still have the sub-diagram. And the sub-diagram has, of course, a sub-divergence. And this degree of divergence of the sub-diagram is still 2. So, of course, this cannot change by this uh, external derivative. And that still has a divergence. And uh, that is how we see that even if we act with the third derivative onto the diagram, we still get the 1 over epsilon pole. And that means the 1 over epsilon pole could not have been a polynomial of second degree. So, and in fact, it goes on. You can take infinitely many derivatives here. You still get this divergence. So even after uh, dp to the power n, we still have a subdivergence for all n. And that explains that we have a non-polynomial divergence. Okay, very obvious. If you have the time and the energy, we can look at the same result from a different angle. For example, what would happen if we actually calculate the right-hand side over there? Uh, what would be the result of this? So the third derivative of this. So if we do the uh, derivative actually of the integrand, then we have this integral. And, uh, okay, from um, the p plus q square in the denominator, we get now um, how many propagators or so four propagators. So we get q to the 8 in the denominator from these four q square propagators. We get here q to the 4 from those two propagators. And uh, 
plus something proportional to p in the denominator, but the highest degree of q is uh, q to the 12 from all these propagators. And then from the derivative, we get each time something like q rho, q nu, q nu in the numerator. So each derivative also gives something with a Lorentz vector, an open index in the numerator. Uh, and then we have the inner loop. And the inner loop, if we calculate it, gives minus q square over epsilon times some prefactor. We know that. That was a polynomial divergence. So this is the subdiagram, which has a polynomial divergence times 1 over epsilon. So what happens if we just plug it in and calculate? Then we can actually, uh, without uh, an actual calculation, we can do a Gedanken calculation. So let us imagine this part. Everything without the 1 over epsilon. Everything without 1 over epsilon is now power counting finite. I mean, because we have taken all these derivatives. So if you count the number of q's, we have q to the 5 divided by q to the 12. Uh, and we integrate over q to the 6. So this is power counting finite with degree of divergence minus 1. So the q integration is completely finite. And uh, the final result can only depend on p, the physics variable which enters the integral. So what must be the result is some function of p which results from a finite integral. And just by dimensional analysis and Lorentz analysis, the result can only look like this. Let's say if we take this literally, it can only look like this. p rho times p nu times p nu divided by the appropriate number of p squares in the denominator to make the dimensionality correct. Nothing else can result from this integral. So what is the correct dimensionality? It is uh, p to the 4, because after three derivatives, we get something which has unit 1 over p. So this must be the result from this finite integral, and this is then multiplied by 1 over epsilon. So now you see uh, that would probably or must be the result of the calculation. Now, where is the logarithm? There is no logarithm anymore because that integral was completely finite, and it cannot give a log if it is finite. And that is, however, consistent because this thing uh, would be the third derivative of the diagram. The diagram contains 1 over epsilon times log p square. So if you take some derivatives of log p square, you get something like this. One derivative of a log gives 1 over p square times some inner derivatives gives exactly an object which looks like this. So what I want to tell you with this is the result uh, is also non-polynomial. be that it is a rational function of p square, not polynomial, but is a rational function, but it fits to a third derivative of log p square. That means everything, no matter how you look at it, it is always consistent. So it's a sanity check so that we understand what we are doing. Now. We have shed some light on the graph and understood how the momentum derivatives could have told us maybe in the beginning that we have to expect a non-polynomial 1 over epsilon pole. And now let's go to some more interesting cases. For example, also the case with other Feynman diagrams with overlapping divergences. So let us look at the two-loop graph plus its sub-renormalization. So first of all, if we take the third momentum derivative just of the one-loop diagram with the one-loop counter-term insertion, 
Of course, exactly the same thing happens. So this here is P plus Q. If we take the derivative, we get this here. And uh, then we have here an explicit one over epsilon, but overall the diagram itself is finite. So the way uh, or the um, mathematical structure of this integral is exactly identical to that structure over there. And the result will also be the same. So clearly this would also explain that this diagram also has a logarithmic uh, p square one over epsilon pole. But what happens if we now do the combination? So first of all, we have now this one loop sub diagram and we have the one loop counter term. Let me again denote here one loop counter term with this uh, index one. And this combination here was finite by construction. That's how we define the counter term. So this is finite in the sense that it does not contain one over epsilon. Let us graphically symbolize this with uh, something like that. That is now a finite object, which is the result of this combination here. So it's a complicated function of p square, which results from the loop integration and uh, after subtracting the one over epsilon pole. Let me highlight that it is a complicated function of p square. However, what happens now if we look at uh, the combination inside the two loop diagram? So we can now use this symbol here. Then this stands for the sum of the actual two loop diagram plus its sub renormalization graph. And uh, we know that this object at the top is finite but complicated. And overall, this is then uh, the sub renormalized two loop diagram. And we can take the third derivative and we get again just three dots here at the lower line. Now, what do we have here? We have now something which is a normal uh, not the normal, but it is a one loop integral. It's, it's one single integration over some momentum k in d dimensions. And the integrand has power counting omega equal minus one. And even though this uh, crossed object here is complicated, it doesn't change the power counting. So the finite part of this remainder, we have not really analyzed it but uh, you can look at it, it uh, the power counting of this, so the large momentum behavior is the same as the one of the counter term itself, so it behaves like p square at most modified by p square times log p square. So if we have omega equal minus one, uh, then the only thing that could be changed by this is uh, that this um, gets modified by a log but that would still be a convergent integral over k. So it's really a normal mathematical uh, convergent integral. And therefore, this is manifestly finite. Cannot contain any one over epsilon pole. And this then shows that the combination of the two diagrams has a polynomial divergence of uh, second degree. That is very nice. So this fits to our explicit calculation. And uh, so without doing the explicit calculation, we could have done just this, let's say, estimate using or analysis using momentum derivatives. And we would have known without calculation uh, that the one over epsilon log pole has to drop out. And it does.
that is nice. Now there is one, if you have uh, understood this important fact, I would like to make a side remark. The side remark is uh, related to the exercise, I think. Uh, this looks like a one loop diagram and we uh, have learned or seen from the master formula that one loop divergences are always one over epsilon poles. However, we know that this thing has a one over epsilon square pole. How is it possible if it looks like a one loop diagram? That is kind of surprising. And the answer is that uh, it looks like one loop, but this is a complicated function of p square. And by complicated, I mean it's a function which cannot directly be reduced to the master formula. Instead, uh, and that is the exercise, it can be reduced to a derivative of the master formula, which then gives an additional power of one over epsilon. So, but it contains one over epsilon square despite this apparent one loop structure. So let's put it in brackets. This is just a side remark. The important remark is that uh, these momentum derivatives can tell us without doing the actual loop calculation what is the structure of one over epsilon divergences. And since we have now found this positive result, we can now for the first time tackle the remaining two loop diagram, which we have not mentioned so far, but uh, some of you have already mentioned and asked for it, where is the remaining two loop diagram? Namely, this one. We have not dared to go to this diagram so far, but now we can because we have developed the momentum derivative technique. So let me shed some light on this two loop diagram. The distinctive feature of this is overlapping divergences. Overlapping divergences mean that if you look at sub diagrams, then you have here a divergent sub diagram. So the left triangle is a triangle one loop diagram which is divergent. But the right diagram here is also a triangle diagram which is also divergent. And so they share the line in the middle. So this is an overlapping divergence. And uh, traditionally in renormalization, these overlapping divergences are uh, considered as a big problem. And uh, of course, I mean, they are. Also, we have not touched this diagram yet. But let us see what uh, these derivatives tell us about the diagram. Actually, we will see that the momentum derivatives uh, tell us all we need to know about this diagram. Even though uh, the structure of derivatives is more difficult or more complicated, but the end result is exactly the same. So first of all, of course, the overall or a superficial degree of divergence is two again. And we have two divergent subdiagrams each of them has degree of divergence zero because these are triangle graphs. So we have two subdiagrams with omega equal zero. Now I need to geometrically arrange this perfectly. Um, so Let's start here. So let's take the third derivative with respect to P of the diagram. Again, of course, we can only do that if we fix where is P in the diagram. So we need to fix some momentum assignments. So let us say, again, the external momentum is P. Then the propagator that goes down here is P plus K. Here we have k coming back, then here p flows out, and let's say here we have p plus q. Then here in the line must flow k minus q 
and here Q. This is one example. Not the only possibility, but it's a good choice. And now we can take the momentum derivatives. And now what happens? You know that uh, simply each time a propagator depends on P, its derivatives give something non-zero. And uh, the thing is a product of all these propagators. So we need to apply the product rule for derivatives, which means we get many terms, we get, for example, three derivatives acting on this, three derivatives acting on that, or some other combination. So it's good to use the dot notation. So one result is, let's put the dots here, so three derivatives acting on the left line. Then one result where the three derivatives act on the right line. Then one result from the product rule where, let's say, two derivatives act here and one derivative acts here. Then a final possibility, one derivative here and two derivatives here. So and uh, as far as I can see, there is no other possibility because we can distribute the three derivatives along these two lines. And there are these possibilities. Let's call this, let's say, one and two. So here the derivatives act on one single line. Here they are distributed. And before going into detail what that means, let us write down next to it the counterterm Feynman diagram, or diagrams, in fact. So there are two Feynman diagrams with counterterms. So one diagram is this one. So you have here from the one loop renormalization a one loop counterterm insertion into the vertex, into the three point vertex. And then you have here a two loop contribution, which is a counterterm diagram that corresponds to this two loop diagram. So you shrink the right sub diagram to a counterterm. That counterterm is constructed such that it cancels the divergence of this right sub diagram. And then there is the other counterterm diagram here on the left. And uh, this counterterm has of course the same value, but graphically it corresponds to a cancellation of the divergence of the left sub-diagram. Anyway, these two counterterm diagrams exist. I mean, we have introduced the counterterm Lagrangian, so there is no way that these counterterm graphs uh, cannot appear, so they appear. Let's write them here and uh, evaluate the third derivative. So then, from the left diagram, what happens if we take the P derivatives. So what is depending on P in this left diagram? It is again only this line. Here flows P plus K. Here there is no P here and there is no P in the counterterm Feynman rule because the counterterm Feynman rule is a constant with respect to momentum. So that was delta G. Okay, so therefore the third derivative in this notation is just three dots on the lower line. And for the other counterterm Feynman diagram, we get three dots on the lower line as well. What do you now see if you look at the three lines combined? Then you see First of all, looking only at the two-loop diagram, does it become finite by taking the derivatives? No, because there are still subdivergences here. And uh, did we expect it to become finite? For sure not, uh, because we have already seen that the simpler two-loop graph, it doesn't become finite by taking three derivatives. Instead, we know uh, the simple two-loop diagram has a polynomial one over epsilon pole, so uh, from this complicated diagram for sure, we also expect a polynomial one over epsilon pole. And here we see that uh, this sub-diagram is still divergent, 
because nothing has changed in the subdiagram. It gives one over epsilon. We already know what it is. And uh, then we have uh, a second integral, which is somehow complicated, but uh, the one over epsilon remains. So this is divergent, and um, that means the left-hand side has a non-polynomial one over epsilon pole for sure. But here, the counterterm diagrams have the same structure again, because here we have a counterterm, which is one over epsilon, and here we have some derivative of the one loop integral, which will make the one loop integral finite, but the one over epsilon remains. So this also corresponds to a polynomial divergence of the original counterterm graph without derivative. And uh, there is a perfect cancellation between these two, because that counterterm cancels the divergence of this rightmost subdiagram. And if we combine the two, what remains is a one loop diagram with power counting negative, which gives something finite. So this combination behaves identically to the combination at the top of the blackboard over there. So these two become finite, and these two become finite as well. Let's write it down. One plus three, the subdivergences cancel. So we get a one loop structure with omega smaller than zero, so this is finite. So this part, the first line and the third line, behaves identically to the diagram at the top without overlapping divergences, so there is no difference. But the difference is now the appearance of the second line. What about the second line? The second line has two subdiagrams, but both subdiagrams are now finite, because in both subdiagrams the degree of divergence was reduced. So here it's reduced to from zero to minus two, here from zero to minus one, here vice versa, but everything is finite. So everything here is finite, and therefore the second line has no subdivergences. So this should be finite. Because we have not proved that it is finite, but we expect it to be finite. There is no reason anymore for it to be divergent. So this explains that this plus that plus this here has overall a polynomial divergence. So, in the end, the result is the same as the result for the simpler two-loop diagram. Once you add the counterterm diagrams which cancel the subdivergences, the combination has a polynomial divergence. And that is irrespective of whether you have overlapping divergences or not. There is again a side remark which I would like to make. Here we saw uh, a structure, namely you start with a two-loop diagram. The two-loop diagram has one subdivergence. You add a counter term to cancel the subdivergence, then you end up with something which has this suggestive form. I therefore invented this graphical form, which looks like a one-loop diagram, and in the one-loop diagram there is a blob, which is somehow complicated, but it doesn't change the power counting. And then you end up with something finite, or polynomial divergence. So now, uh, you might do the same thing here. So let's imagine somebody looks at a diagram. Maybe accidentally they draw the diagram like this. 
then you look at it and you see, aha, uh, here there is a subdivergence. I can cancel the subdivergence by adding this counter term here. Then overall, this has this structure. So I canceled the subdivergence and I end up with something like this, which has the same suggestive form as the one at the top. So here you have something finite, which doesn't change the power counting, and you insert it into a one-loop diagram. So you have a one-loop structure with a finite integrand, like over there. And over there, that was enough to give you a result which has a polynomial divergence. Does this have a polynomial divergence? cannot be because uh, we are missing exactly one half of the counter terms. I mean, the result of those two diagrams is of course the same. So we have just uh, forgotten one half of the counter terms. And so somehow this is not enough. And that means the correct statement is not uh, cancel the subdivergence until you get such an expression where you uh, have this shape finite blob inserted into a one-loop diagram. This is not the criterion, but the correct criterion is add all counterterm diagrams which cancel all subdivergences, and then you get a polynomial divergence. Okay. So it's just two different, um, let's say, you could invent a criterion that looks like this, so always add counterterms until you get this structure can do it, but that is not a helpful thing to do. That is what the side remark uh, shows you. So this is, um, this is a finite blob. But the whole thing still contains 1 over epsilon times ln p square. This is the side remark. And I believe that it is things like this which uh, were at the heart of um, people saying that overlapping divergences are complicated or particularly difficult to deal with, since maybe naively you might structure your renormalization in such a way. You take always one subdiagram, cancel its divergence, and then plug it into the full diagram, and you go on. But this is not the correct thing to do. It doesn't lead uh, to the right structure. This is the right structure. And uh, so now we have understood also this point with the help of this example. And so all of these examples, as I said already before, uh, should help you in guiding your intuition of what you can expect, and we will, of course, certainly refer back to the examples later when we do more general investigations. And so, uh, for sure, we now know certain statements which would be desirable to prove at all orders, and certain other statements which are useless uh, to try proving, because they cannot work. Okay? So this is the point of these examples. That ends the discussion of power counting and momentum derivatives. And so in principle, we are now at a stage where we have then dealt with um, many examples uh, preparing us for doing renormalization in general.